you would like to follow along in your Bibles, the scripture reading for the lesson this morning is from John chapter 17, verses 11 through 26. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. I am no longer in this world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guard, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you, you have given me, I, give, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that the world, that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, I have known you, and these have known you, have known that you sent me. I, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Please be seated and mark your songbooks at number 619. 619. <clears throat> Sanctify them. By thy truth, thy word is truth. That particular verse of scripture, along with the one where Jesus prayed that believers would all be one as he and the Father were one, perhaps the two most familiar parts of this incredible prayer that Jesus worded as he was headed to Gethsemane, ultimately facing the cross of Calvary. Those are the parts of, the, of his prayer that we're most familiar with. Those are the ones, that's the parts of the prayer that we often, most, at least most often, hear sermons about. And yet, this entire prayer is just truly incredible. And if you wanted to summarize the prayer, basically what you have is... In verses 1 through 5, Jesus is asking the Father's blessings in behalf of his own self. He asked the Father to glorify him with the glory that he had with the Father before the world was made. In verses 16 through 19, Jesus asked the Father's blessings in behalf of the apostles. And then in verses 20 through 26, he asked the Father's blessings in behalf of all believers who would become believers through the words that would be proclaimed and would be written down by the apostles. That would be you and me today, along with our brothers and sisters in Christ of the first century and all centuries in between. I want us to look at this prayer in a little bit more depth and detail this morning. Beginning in verse 11, where Jesus begins his his 
intercession in behalf of the apostles. And even though the things that we're going to be looking at initially in this lesson this morning were things that Jesus prayed for in behalf of his apostles specifically, we will see that they are also applicable for you and me today as children of God. And then the latter part of the prayer, of course, was indeed directed toward God's blessings toward all believers, which would include you and me. Beginning in verse 11, in regard to Jesus' prayer for us today, we find where Jesus prayed to the Father that they might be kept. And that is the apostles. You notice that I put in the subheading there, I guess, that we may be kept, and I'm referring to the King James Version of this particular scripture just because of the way that it is worded. Jesus prayed to the Father, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. If we were to just rely on this passage of scripture alone, we might be at a loss as to figure out exactly what Jesus had in mind when he was praying to the Father in behalf of the apostles that he would keep them. Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to be buried in a borrowed tomb. He's going to be raised the third day. And then 40 days later, he would ascend into the heavens to sit down at the right hand of God. And he tells the Father, while I have been here on this earth, I have kept them. I have taken care of them, speaking of the apostles. And now he is praying that the Father would keep them as well, as he will be returning to the Father. What does he mean by that? And you know what, we don't have to guess because God tells us. Just a couple of verses later in verse 15, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. You know, there is just no way that we can overemphasize our need for diligence our need for soberness of mind in dealing with Satan. Peter tells us that we need to be sober-minded, that we need to be diligent because the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice what what Peter says. He says that the devil is seeking after those whom he may devour. He's a predator, just like a lion is a predator. And he is seeking out anyone and everyone that he might be able to find an advantage over so that he might, through his devices, get us to follow after him rather than God. And so Jesus, knowing that like he himself, was how he was going to be brutalized, hung on the cross of Calvary, and all the things that he had to endure in his faithful worship and service of the Father while he was here upon this earth, that his apostles, likewise, he was going to send them out into a world that was not going to, uh, to like the message that they had to say. The Apostle Paul, perhaps more than anyone else, we're at least more familiar with his travels and the things that happened to him because more of the, his life is recorded for us. But we know from secular history that the apostles, all of them except for the Apostle John, at least secular history Uh, traditionally indicates that all the apostles met with just horrible deaths because of the persecution that they had to endure at the hands of Nero and others in the first century. You and I today, we don't necessarily face that kind of persecution, at least not yet, that might come to be, but we don't face a life and death kind of persecution, but we do face difficulties and we certainly face every single day of our life the diligence of Satan trying his very best to get us to follow him rather than God. And his prayer to the Father in behalf of the apostles, I believe, 
is just as applicable for you and me because he sits at the right hand of God to ever make intercession for us. And I believe that he is saying that he is asking the Father that we be kept as well, even as he kept the apostles. Well, what, does that, what does that mean? What's that all about? We need to work together with God to overcome Satan. Now God's part, I believe, is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Just look at the promises that God has made to us in that one passage of Scripture. The first promise that God has made to us is you're going to be tempted. It's not necessarily a promise, but perhaps a warning. But what God wants us to know, <coughs> first of all, is that Satan is going to be after us. He's going to constantly be after us. But then God says, you know what, but I am going to be faithful that I'm going to do this for you. I am going to not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to endure. I'm going to limit what Satan can do, just like he did in the case of Job. I'm not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but not only that, I am going to provide a way of escape for you so that you will be able to endure it. Now, this is God's part. This is God's promise. And he tells us, I am going to be faithful in that promise to you. As we work together with God to overcome Satan, there is our part that I believe John describes to us in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. You know, this is kind of a troubling verse of Scripture for a lot of people. Especially that first phrase there that we know that no one who is born of God sins. I'm born of God. Everyone who is here this morning and a member of the body of Christ has been born again and has been born of God. And yet John says, we know that no one who is born of God sins. I'm a sinner. And I sinned. And I continue to sin from time to time. And every one of us who are assembled here this morning, even though we're children of God and born of God, we continue to sin. So what is John saying here? This is one of those times (coughs) when a little bit of understanding concerning the original language really comes in handy. This is one of those times when having a lexicon at home, having a Bible dictionary at home, having a Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words comes in handy because that word sins there literally is in the present active tense in the Greek and it means continues to sin. So what John is saying here, he, we know that no one who is born of God continues to sin. And you might think, well, that don't seem to help a whole lot either. But I think that what John is telling us is the same thing that the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. And that is that we are to be dead to sin and alive unto God. That we as Christians, <coughs> we have an awesome responsibility to God to become a new creature, a new creation in Christ. As Christians, we are to crucify the old man of sin and put him to death. As Christians, we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are to be partakers of the divine nature. We are to grow spiritually and we are to get to a point as mature Christians that sin is just not an everyday companion in our lives, but more of an intruder into our lives. I I really get a little bit concerned sometimes when I hear someone in the public assembly pray about asking God to help us 
because we know that we are sinful creatures and we've, we sin many, many times or we sin often against the... Brethren, I don't believe that that's what God intends for us. I don't think that that's God's design for us as His children at all. I believe that God expects and demands of us as His children that we grow in the faith, we grow in strength, and that we take advantage of God's promises that we find there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 and that we get to a state of spiritual maturity to where sin interrupts our lives from time to time but not all the time. That we actually resist the devil so that he will flee from us. <coughs> Let's look at it a little bit closer. God says that He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. That's the reason why when we become a child of God that we need to continue to mature in the faith so that we do not continue to sin. But that we recognize our weaknesses, our fallacies, we recognize those areas of our lives wherein Satan is going to constantly bombard us and we fortify that area of our life and we work toward that without neglecting the other things. Being a Christian is a tough job. It's a 24-hour-a-day job. It's not something that we can just play around with. It's not something that we can just do half-heartedly. It takes incredible maximum effort to be the kind of child of God that He expects us to grow up to be. The fullness of Christ, we're told in Ephesians. And so God says, you know what, I'm not going to let you be, be tempted above what you're able. That way, you're actually going to be able not to sin. Satan may come calling, he may lay at your feet all kinds of temptation, but I'm going to make it possible for you that you can resist. And we see that even more as we continue to look at that. We know that no one who is born of God sins because God provides a way of escape. Every time, with every sin, God provides a way of escape. Our job, our part of the equation, working together with God to overcome Satan, is that when we're tempted, we run to God. We cleave unto God. We stand in the power and might of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We put on the whole armor of God. And we look... <coughs> excuse me. I'm having a little trouble with allergies, I think, this morning. But we look for that way of escape that God has promised us. Yeah, it's easier to give in, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier for us to just say, you know what, I, I'll do better next time. Unfortunately, next time might not come because we know not the hour when our Lord shall return. So we need to be determined in our mind, committed in our mind that we're going to be faithful to God because God is faithful to us to not allow us to be tempted above that which we're able to bear, but He will provide a way of escape so that we will not continue in sin. And then Paul, I think, aptly described what it's like when we work together with God as we should. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced. What are you convinced of, Paul? I am convinced that he is able to do what? To keep what I have entrusted to him until that day. What have you entrusted to God? That which we're supposed to entrust to God for our keeping is our eternal soul. The salvation of our soul. And I believe that when Jesus prayed that God would keep His apostles, and applying that to you and me today as God's children, I believe that what Jesus was praying for was answered. All the apostles remained faithful to the Lord and is continuing to be answered today in your life and in my life. As we continue, we see in John uh, chapter 17 and verse 13, But now I have come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. 
This can be a tricky verse if you don't pay close attention to it. Do you see that incredible statement, that incredible request that Jesus is making of the Father? He is telling, asking the Father for the apostles, but for you and me today as well. He says, I come to you. And what he is asking of the Father is that they may have my joy. You see, Jesus didn't pray that we would have joy. Jesus didn't pray that we would have some kind of joy, even some joy that is part of the world's kind of joy. But he asked for the apostles, and I believe for you and me today, that we would have his joy. Well, what joy was that? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Is the Hebrew writer saying that it wasn't any big deal, Jesus going to the cross? Absolutely not. That's not what he's saying at all. What the Hebrew writer is saying is that Jesus, his body brutalized and just torn to shreds, mocked and spit upon, cursed by people, suspended between heaven and earth on a Roman cross, bearing the sin of the entire world and the judgment of God for that sin. And yet there was a joy in his heart that none of that could remove. Because you see, Jesus knew that in being faithful to his charge, being faithful to the Father, that yes, he was going to die. Yes, he was going to bear the sin of the world. Yes, he was going to be forsaken by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew all of those things were going to happen. He also knew that he was going to, just a few days from then, go back to the Father. He's going to get to go home. And he was going to get to be with his Father once again. And it was a joy within him that not even the crucifixion could remove, could take away from him. It's a joy that absolutely nothing on the face of this earth can disturb. And that's what Jesus is praying for, for the apostles and for you and me, that they may have my joy, my kind of joy, so that you and I today can also face life with all of its difficulties, with all its trials, with all its problems, and still have a heart filled with joy. Uh, this last week I went down <clears throat> to Gadsden, Indiana, or week before last I guess it was. Brother Bob Dickey was in a gospel meeting down there. He was bringing some things from Florida that he wanted to give to me, and I, I forgot to give this announcement to Nick, but there is a letter on the bulletin board on your left-hand side as you're leaving the building from Brother Bob Dickey, a letter of thanks and appreciation for the three years of financial support that we, uh, we gave him uh, while uh, down doing the work there in Florida. Bob wanted to give me that letter and some other things personally to me, and so I went down to Gadsden to get those things from Bob and to get to hear some good preaching for a change. And on the sign, they had a sign, kind of like this one that we have outside our building here, and on their sign, there was this saying, do not pray for ease of life. Pray to be a stronger person. And I like that very much. I think that that's what we're reading about here in Hebrews chapter 12. That we need to pray to be stronger and we need to pray that we can have the kind of joy that Jesus had so that absolutely nothing in this life can rob us of our joy. Because we're children of God. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi saying, Rejoice in the Lord again, I say rejoice. And James would remind us that we should count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And I believe that again, that's exactly what we read about Jesus. And that is that he had much to endure taking on the sin of the world. But it did not rob him of his joy of returning to the Father. In this life we have trials. In this life we have difficulties. In this life we have sorrow. And I'm not saying that when we suffer the loss of a loved one or whatever that it's wrong for us to cry and to be upset and that sort of thing. I'm not saying that. Those are just natural human responses to, to circumstances. What I'm saying though is, is that we cannot, as Christians, it would be an affront to God, I believe, for us to wallow in all of that stuff. And to even be uh, where we can face those kinds of things because even though we might be filled with sorrow for a, a while, that has nothing to do with whether or not I can remain faithful to God and go home just like Jesus went home. My goal needs to be to go home. And that should fill my heart and my life with such joy unspeakable that absolutely nothing can wipe a, f a smile off my face as far as the long term is concerned. And Jesus was praying for that. We sing in vacation Bible school especially what we call a kid's song, a child's song, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. It's not just a kid's song. That's a good song for all of us. Every one of us should have the joy, 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 joy down in our heart, and it should stay there. Just as the joy in Jesus' heart stayed there, even facing the cross. And then Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And the word sanctified there just simply literally means to set apart. And we all know that as Christians we are sanctified people. We're to be a set apart people. Peter put it this way. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Let me emphasize some things in that verse for you. Peter says you're a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession. And the reason why is because you are the people of God. If you're here this morning and you're a member of the body of Christ, all of those descriptive terms are applicable to you. That as Christians, as, in, as we band together as Christians, we're a chosen race. We're God's chosen. A royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for God's possession because you and I, as members of the body of Christ, are the people of God. And because that is true, we need to set ourselves apart from the world. We need to make sure that we're not allowing this world to influence our lives so that the world keeps creeping into our lives, but rather instead that we need to stand firm and we need to stand strong and we need to resist and that we can show the world around about us clearly that we are different from other people in the world. Gene and I study by phone every Thursday evening. This past Thursday we're in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 28 Paul reminds the brethren there at Ephesus that they needed to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Brethren, I believe that if we want to really set ourselves apart from the rest of the world, we need to focus on those three things. Because in the world in which we live, just the simple thing of being kind is practically lost. Everybody is out for themselves. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But God's people, this people of God are people who are kind. And not only that, but they are people who are tender 
hearted. And I think about that. I think about my brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's, it's kind of one of those things that we need to think about this tender hearted business. Because as I look out over this audience and I look at my brothers and sisters in Christ here, that's what I see. I see people who are tender hearted. Because sometimes it is necessary for one of us to maybe come forward at the invitation, confess sin, seek the forgiveness of the church here, and ask for the help, the encouragement, and the prayers of the saints. I've seen men, big, strong, stout men, who confessing their sins break down and cry like a baby. And you know how come? Because there's a tenderness of heart that they have. That the love of God and the, the power of God has worked in their lives. To where they're not calloused. And they're not interested in being a macho, macho man. They're interested in having a tender heart that is pliable. A heart that God can work with. A heart that God can move to repentance. And we need a tender heart so that we can deal with one another in love. Because Paul concluded that, that thought there, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. This last week on the History Channel, they had an hour-long documentary on Gary Ridgway. I don't know if any of you remember who Gary Ridgway is. Gary Ridgway is a man who killed about 91 women back in the 80s and early 90s. He strained them to death. And the man had absolutely, seemingly no emotional makeup to where it bothered him at all. They showed actual footage of his trial. And the man stood there, sat there throughout that trial, knowing that he had taken the lives of 91 women people, most of them teenagers, and in their 20s. Very few were in their 30s, but none were older than, I think, 38. They had their whole lives basically ahead of them, and he took it away from them, 91 of them. And he sat there in that courtroom just stone-faced. His eyes, almost eyes like a shark. You know, sharks, they don't have any kind of expression in their eyes at all. It's just this black orb there. Toward the end of the trial, they allowed family members, some of the family members of his victims, stand at a podium, look him face to face, and tell him what they thought about him. And there were some of them that were pretty dramatic as far as their hatred for him. And he was able to look them square in the eye like he had done nothing. No emotion whatsoever. Until this one gentleman, white hair, white beard, approached the podium and his words to this man was, Sir, God says that we are to forgive. I want you to know, sir, you are forgiven. He had killed his daughter. And the man said, You are forgiven. And Gary Ridgway broke down and wept bitterly. The only time he had ever shown any kind of emotion at all. But the power of forgiveness is beyond belief. The power of forgiveness is something that sets a person free. The power of forgiveness is that which allows us to live in confidence and hope before a God who is perfect in holiness. The power of forgiveness is that which allows us to exist with others in the local congregation in peace and unity. The power of forgiveness and kindness and tenderheartedness is that power which allows us to work together in service to our God. And that leads us to this next part of the prayer wherein Jesus said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, 
but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The joy which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. And this is a part of the prayer of Jesus that I believe a lot of people think has gone unanswered. Because look, look at the religious world, look at the division in the religious world, look at all the different denominations in the world, look at all the different sectarian names in the religious world where this group over here doesn't want to have anything to do with this group over here and I'm not going to wear your name because I'm going to wear this name and it was a problem even in the early church as we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And a lot of folks may think that Jesus' prayer here, that they all may be one, has never been answered and perhaps will never be answered this side of heaven. I am here to tell you, I believe it was answered on the day of Pentecost. Because you remember on the day of Pentecost, when Peter, Peter preached that sermon, and there were that throng of Jews who said, what shall we do? And they were instructed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. They did that and there were 3,000 of them added to the body of Christ. And you know what we read about them? One of the first things, one of the first descriptive things about those Christians were they were of one mind. They were of one mind. And they were all together and no one counted what was theirs to be their own, but was sharing with one another as there was a need. You see, I don't believe that Jesus is praying in regard to all the people of the world. I believe that the prayer here of Jesus is that you and me as his true believers. There's a lot of people out there that claim to believe in Jesus Christ. The devils also believe and tremble, James tells us. So there's a lot of people that believe that Jesus is the Christ. But they're not true believers because they're not doing what Jesus says he wants them to do. Why call me ye Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? I believe the prayer that Jesus is asking of the Father here is that you and me, true believers, be one, of one mind, of one heart. That we work together as one, even as Jesus and the Father work together as one. So that we can go about, as Tom talked about when he uh, led our thoughts in regard to the contribution this morning, so that we can go about and we can together in a unified fashion as one go about doing the work that God has given us to do. That's the reason why that it's so important, this kindness, this tenderness of heart, and this forgiving one another. It's the reason why that's so important. Because it's so easy isn't it? It's just so easy for us to look at the failures and the foibles, the disappointments of people and, and focus on that rather than focusing on the one thing that we need to be focusing on and that is that we are family in Jesus Christ and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and we cannot allow ourselves to focus on the failures of one another but to help one another succeed and forgive one another and support one another so that we can indeed be one. We cannot let personal preferences, we cannot let pride, we cannot let anything interfere with this oneness that Jesus prayed for and that I believe that we can have. And Paul warned the church there at Galatia, it says, so, Jesus said that he wanted this to be true because he said, so that the world may believe that you sent me and you and I are the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We're the ones that need to be demonstrating to the world what it means to be a Christian so that the people will truly believe that Jesus is the Christ. But look what Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed one by another. We need to be careful, very, very careful, brethren. Are we to help one another with our shortcomings? Absolutely. Are we to point out to one another things that we see that need to be pointed out because they are amiss in our lives? Absolutely. With kindness, tenderness of heart, and a forgiving attitude. And we do that so that we can be one in Christ. 
so that the world would believe that the Father sent him. And then look what Jesus prays for next. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, and of course, remember, this part of the prayer is you and me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory. What an incredible prayer Jesus prayed for you and me. He says, Father, I desire that they be with me where I am. You remember in John 14, Jesus said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Why does Jesus want us with him? Why does Jesus want us with him so much that he would be willing to go to the cross and endure all that was a part of the cross of Calvary? Well, he tells us, so that they may see my glory. Because, you see, while Jesus was here upon this earth, what we saw, according to Isaiah 53, is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. What we saw of Jesus and what we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning Jesus is that he took on a body of flesh and he had for a period of time to have to endure all the infirmities and all the things attendant to being a a human being. He got wearied. He got tired. He got frustrated. And he was hurt, physically hurt. You know... We read there in Acts chapter 4 about how that the council took a, 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 a observed Peter and John and how that they recognized them as having been with Jesus. And we have oftentimes commented how that it must have really been something to have been with Jesus while he was here upon this earth. And yet what the, what the apostles saw and what the disciples saw while Jesus was here upon this earth They saw his body ripped to shreds. They saw him nailed to a Roman cross. They saw him in anguish cry out. They saw a man who was so wearied traveling along back to Jerusalem that he had to stop at Jacob's well and just rest for a while. What Jesus wants for you and me is better than what the apostles saw while he was here upon this earth. He wants you and me to be with him where he is so that we can see his glory. So that we can see the glory of the Son of God. That's exactly what I'm looking forward to. Seeing the glory of the very Son of God. And then finally, in verse 26, Jesus prayed, And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. And again, kind of like verse 13, if you're not careful, you're going to miss it. What is Jesus praying for here? For you and for me? He says, so that the love with which you love me may be in them. In the shadow of the cross, Jesus was asking the Father to help us that we can have the kind of love for one another that the Father had for him. That's tall order right there. (laughs) That's That's a really tall order. It would be easy, I think, if you will, to love Jesus after all he is perfect. He committed no sin. He never did anything wrong as far as wronging a fellow human being. You and I, we sin. You and I, we offend one another. You and I, we get crossways of one another from time to time. But that does not negate the fact that the prayer of Jesus for us was, you know what I want them to do? I want them to work real hard to have the kind of love that you have for me. 
but that's the kind of love that they demonstrate one for another. That's a tall order, but it was the prayer of Jesus. Can that be fulfilled? I think so. We can indeed love one another. We're created in the image of God. Oh no, we're not going to be perfect in love. But as Paul said, we can ever press toward the high calling in Christ Jesus. And I can work very, very hard to love my brethren in Christ with the kind of love that God demonstrated for His own Son. And I think that that's what He wants us to do. Let's have that kind of love. We go back to the beginning of the prayer and Jesus said, This is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is predicated upon us knowing God and knowing Jesus. Knowing God and Jesus in the sense that we allow them to do for us what they want to do for us, and that is to save us from our sins and to give us a hope of eternal life, a home in heaven that we can enjoy forever and ever and ever. The question for all of us this morning then is, do I truly know God? Do I know Him in such a way that it will eventuate in me having a heavenly home? Do I know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Have I put Him on in baptism? Because that's what we read about in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, that we are baptized into Jesus Christ and salvation is found only in Christ and so if you have not been baptized into Christ then you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning and we would encourage you to do that while together we stand and while we sing